all of the scariness that comes with growing a business can actually be like, that's the adventure that you're on. And it's a cool adventure. Like every time you get up on stage and you're like scared out of your mind that there are 1500 people looking at you and like you have to say something that's going to get you good ratings at the end of it because they've all got their phones and they can all review your talk that you just gave. That's scary as F, but it's also like that's the adventure. And I wouldn't have thought of it that way until probably the last year that like, no, no, this isn't the part you avoid. This is the part you were looking for. This is Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. I'm here to help you find the clues that will lead you to your calling. This week's guest is the definitive expert on copywriting for startups. One day, Joanna Weeb was hanging out on a web forum, helping a few startup founders with their copy. The next thing she knew, she had an inbox filled with requests for her help. So many people needed her copy help that she couldn't help them all. So Joanna released some eBooks under the name Copy Hackers and made about $30,000 right away. Since then, Joanna has helped hundreds of entrepreneurs with their copy. But the more time she spent writing copy, the more she realized that all writers struggle with one thing, facing the blank page. Joanna has built a new app called Air Story to help serious writers collect together all the pieces that make good writing and make it happen. I immediately found it interesting myself because I've learned the hard way over the years that writing is not linear. Air Story helps bring the research and the collaboration components of writing into a single cohesive experience. Joanna and I will talk more about how to keep the creative process going smoothly. Plus, she'll share some great tips on doing customer research. I especially like her hack of combing through Amazon reviews. Learn how by following her passion, improvising with what she had, and facing her fears, Joanna has gone from her day job to an information business to building Air Story. Here's Joanna Weeb. Don't forget, I'm giving out a $20 Amazon gift card every week until April 7th. The sooner you go to cadv.net slash survey, the greater your chances of winning. Go to cadv.net slash survey to take the short survey and be entered to win a gift card. Uh, Can you start off telling us about Air Story? Yeah, totally. So Air Story is um it's a drag technically a drag and drop document builder which is like wah wah like what is that right <laughs> like tell me what that is but it's like you know how when you're using lead pages or unbounce and you can like drag and drop a landing page together um or using canva and you can drag and drop a, a header for facebook together um or whatever you're using mailchimp has newsletter templates you can drag and drop things together in there too But documents don't really have that. So we do all of this writing for work, right? When you think about a report that you might have, where there are things like, you know, Word comes with templates, which nobody has ever used in the history of Word. Like, I no, you open one like resume template, and you're like, are you serious? And you close it down. (laughs) And you still have to, even if you use that, you still have to go ahead and um, fill it all in yourself. So I do a lot of writing. And I know a lot of marketers do a lot of writing. You don't even realize you're like writing. You're just putting together another brief or another campaign plan or something like that. Um, and of course, then there is the whole side of the business that is working on content, like your lead magnet eBooks and the blog posts that nobody wants to write anymore because you're super fatigued by content. Um, all of that is... So all of the material that we, that we create in business um, is really little pieces stacking up to make bigger pieces. Like a little piece of information becomes, you know, a, a data point becomes something that you base a report around or that you use on the opening screen or a page of a report, let's say. Um, all of these little pieces make up our bigger documents that we create. But when you go to use, when you go to put together any sort of document, you're always facing this like blank white page, right? You open up Google Docs or you open up Word and it's this white sheet 
of paper that's like, I dare you, right? Like, come on, come fill me in. Let's see what you can do. And you're like, I don't know how to fill the page. Um, so we end up going out and finding information and pasting it onto the page. Problem there is like this whole thing that you're using to write in is not made for people who actually write for work where you want to be efficient. You want to stack all of your information up as you go. So AirStory makes it so that you can save all your little assets, all of the things that you use, just like Evernote, right? Where you save little pieces, but instead of just leaving them somewhere, you can drag those little pieces onto the page. So when you're putting a report together, you can drag on that data point that your analyst sent you and the thing your CMO said, um, drag that on there, organize it. If you've got other information you're finding online, drag that onto the page too. Um, so it's really just a matter it's, it's rethinking how we write for work, not by rethinking it, but by paying attention to how people actually put documents together in their work life and then making a solution that supports that rather than forcing you to stare at a blank page and like fill it in um, with whatever you happen to think of and whatever you can copy and paste from all over the world in there. Yeah. So when you're writing documents, there's always all these things that you are... uh, you're, you're probably repeating a lot of things that you've said before, or you have these these places where oh, I need some data to make my case here, and and that can all really get into the creative. That can all get in the way of the creative process of doing the writing. So I could imagine even, you know, you could you could say oh, I need some data about this. You could take that off as a piece and and delegate it to somebody else on your team yeah, that way. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We actually have um, some people using it right now. I don't know if I'm allowed to use their names, so I won't say it, but they're working on some really cool books that got their pub, they've published nonfiction writers, um, who, you know, work in the tech world and they're using it right now. Um, and in some cases we're assigning research assistants to them, right? Somebody who can go into your document and have research access really only where their job is to go in and put that information into your project. So they'll make little cards. Um, with that, but that's something that you would do like if you're a professor and you have grad students. I was an RA and I know like exactly the process you go through um, when you're finding resources for a prof and putting them so that that prof can go and present a paper on it. Well, you're going to go read a whole bunch of things. You're going to highlight things and type them out for your prof and then your prof goes and does something with them. Um, and that's the same kind of thing here. So it's just you put somebody in your document, they add what we call cards um, because we're big Trello fans. And so it's like using Trello cards, um, but they go in and they create a bunch of cards that you can then just organize on the page, which is ultimately how we all write the bigger pieces, like anything that you're working on that's important is usually based on a whole bunch of other information that you just organize on the page. And that's, that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. This idea really clicked with me when I saw it because I, I think it took me so much time doing creative work, including writing. Specifically, it was when I started having to write my book when I discovered that that facing that blank page and then and then making something happen on that blank page is not writing. There's a whole bunch of other there's a whole bunch of other mental activities that have to go on before you can you can do that writing and so there is like you have to be doing the the research off uh, as a separate thing but once you've done that stuff once you have all that stuff to work with then things start to go really easily yeah and, then and, it's a stitching together kind of process right where you're like okay let's i've got all of the pieces in place and now i need to tell a cohesive story i need to take all of that and turn it into something that will Makes sense, right? And that's where you get to, to write. That's where you get to be the writer. Of course, as you go through that, you move things around. Like there's, I don't know, unless you had a very unique experience, writing a book is not a linear process, right? You don't like first sit down and do the research, then go do the writing, then go do the editing. Like it doesn't no, happen. Just like write that. 250 words a day, then you'll be done. That doesn't work that way. No. Let me see somebody who's done that. Good Lord, let me see that person, right? It's great advice. Good luck actually taking it. So it doesn't actually work that way. And as you're writing something, you realize, 
oh, that piece isn't going to work anymore, right? Like, oh, and you don't, this is the kill your darlings idea, but even in nonfiction too, that darling could be an entire chapter that isn't a creative endeavor necessarily, but it's like this huge point that you put a lot of work into and it no longer fits in your book. It's no longer going to work in there. So what do you do with that? Most of us like cry, drink, and then like find a way to hit cut on that big piece. Um, and then where does that piece go? So Air Story is built for that part of the process too. When you're like, okay, I've organized everything. I'm stitching it together. I'm starting to turn it into something, but there's this big section or a little section that isn't going to work anymore. So you can highlight that and just take it off the page by turning it into a card. So you're not cutting it, moving it somewhere else. You just kind of, it's like, I think of this as like putting it in a drawer. So if you were like, if you took a page you know, like this page isn't going to work. I'm just going to put it in this drawer for now and then I'll come back and get it later. That's the idea too, right? So as you're going through and you're, you're revising your work, um, you highlight the things that aren't working anymore. You click a little button and it goes and turns into a card so that if you decide it'll work later, you can still drag that back in. Or if it doesn't work here, but it might work as a blog post that you can use to promote your book, you've got that, right? Like it's all right there where you're going to do the writing. Um, so there's that. And then in the same token, um, sometimes you want to move an entire section of your book around, right? Like you're like, okay, this felt like it was chapter two, but now it's feeling more like, like chapter seven. Like it has to follow this other piece instead of again, cutting a huge section and moving it. You can just switch to a different view and drag your chapters around with all the content underneath. So building out for those real writing experiences for people who actually write for a living, not, you know, hobbyists, but people who have a lot on the line and getting that document produced really well. So, yeah. This reminds me of the process of Ryan Holiday, who has been on the podcast before. He has a very analog process, which you might be familiar with. He has what he calls a commonplace book. He reads a book and then he goes through and and by hand writes on index cards, the little anecdotes and things, and then files them away in boxes. And and, and then you, you'll take out one of his boxes and say, okay, here's, here's a book. This is all organized, all these anecdotes. And then from there he can, he it's, from there, it's easy to write a book after that, right? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, right. So easy. No, but it's true. And the commonplace book was one of our early, like we were thinking hard about how people use the commonplace book early on in the development of Air Story. Um, and I know that there's always going to be this component that is analog. It will, right? Like there's always going to be this need to write down something really quickly. Like, oh, I just got that idea or... You, you see something or you overhear a conversation, you have to write down what you took away, right? That great story when you're like listening to NPR and someone tells a very cool story and you're like, oh man, I need to use that anecdote at some point. I don't know when. So we know that's going to happen. But ultimately what it comes down to is that transcription where you do end up writing your book or your blog post or whatever that big thing is. You write it in a digital writing space. Um, and of course, you can do things with those offline pieces, right? With if you can take a picture and forward it, or you can, for a lot of us, we're thoughtful enough with our work that we're like, okay, I have written all this stuff down, but now I'm going to go spend a couple hours and rewrite pieces out, um, making, turning it into those, just like you would do in an analog way, where you have the cards that you, like the actual recipe cards that you create, you just now type that and tag it instead of going through and doing that. Like a lot of people are already doing with Evernote. But then at this point, you can move your pieces out of Evernote instead of like sticking them and leaving them in Evernote. I'm actually making use of them. So yeah, quickly turning that, all of that content where if you, I mean, this is what's happened for me too. Like I find with my content creation process, um, I'm constantly, like most people, I'm always, um, always in writing slash slash research mode, right? Like it never stops. Sadly, <laughs> it never stops. And so like I'll come across a whole bunch of different things over time that might be about selling to millennials. Like how should we speak to millennials? Because people love to believe it's like a very different way to sell to millennials as an example. But you'll come across like 10, 12, 15 different articles that talk about this. You might get one or two pieces out of each. What do you do with those? In some worlds, like we're talking about this commonplace book, you would write those down different index cards. In this case, you would just clip those things with our little clipper and then send them to your story project. And then later on, when you're like, what should I write about? 
and you go like if you're short on ideas or you want to push out a new chapter or something like that, um, then you go in and you search through all of those cards you've like stacked away over time. Everything tagged millennial and suddenly you're in really good shape to put out content a lot faster because it's right there. Now, Air Story is a web application at the moment, right? Yes, it is. So that's good because you can you can use it to collaborate with a team. I know like one app that I like to use is Scrivener, but there's like no cloud support to it at all. If I have a like an anecdote or something that I want to save for later, I have to put it into Evernote and then I have to remember to like put it in Scrivener. And if I'm collaborating with somebody, then forget it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's I mean, yeah. I so full disclosure, I've installed Scrivener maybe twice. I've opened it. I have no idea how to use it, right? Like, I am like, oh, wow. Like, it's different. And that's often the case. People are going to find the same thing with Air Story. You open it and you're like, which part do I do first, right? Should I add cards first or should I start writing first? Because you can do either first, right? So it's like, well, what does your process look like? Like, do what you do. Um, but yeah, I get it. That, but that's, I mean, knowing what Air Story is definitely about, easier to use than, than Scrivener. Scrivener is like, I don't know. I feel like, Looking at Scrivener is the same way that it feels for a lot of people when they first open up Photoshop, like the full, oh, the full Photoshop thing, and they're just like, "There's so much stuff here. I have Terrifying. no idea. I can't. I, I just want to draw a layer? circle. What's the layer? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Totally. How do I whiten teeth? What? I need like seven layers of different filters. What? Um, so yeah, no, completely. Um, and that's nice of you. That's nice of you to say. I feel the same way, but of course, I've been so close to Air Story throughout all of the user research and all of the iterations to get it to where it is today. But um, yeah, it, it's meant to be an easier solution for people who do exactly what you just said. I just don't know. But yeah, if you need to collaborate with people because it's online, it's completely easy, which I know, uh, again, one of those one of those writers who's working on that book, um, he, the last time I published a book, he had a lot of people beta read it for him and like beta edit it so they had to be invited to that same document and then work in that document um so yeah it's a, that's um the ability to collaborate isn't just in those early stages but in those final stages right when maybe you are too close to your book or maybe you are better at thinking than you are at like forming really, really great sentences. And so you can have those great um, beta readers or beta editors come in and help you out with that. So yeah, that's what Air Story is good for. I hope. So how did you, how did you discover that Air Story needed to exist? Oh, because I write constantly, like constantly. It's fully part of my job. Um, And I know a lot of people who are in the same boat. So I get to speak at a lot of conferences and those conferences are usually for conversion rate optimization and marketing and things like that. So you talk to a lot of people who are in marketing, especially like other speakers um, who are in marketing, they're running marketing teams, they're CMOs, whatever it might be. And they're so fatigued. Like they're so tired. They know that content marketing is huge as an opportunity for their business. But they're tired of making it. Everybody on their team is tired of it. It's hard to find a really enthusiastic person to put together your content today, right? And do a really good job, like a Brian Dean level of content creation here, right? Which is like what everybody is striving for. So we were feeling the same way. And I was tired of starting a post, starting to write something in Google Docs or even in WordPress, and then abandoning it. And never going back to it, knowing it was like a potentially good idea, right? Something that you know your audience wants, you're stoked about it, you write in it, but then you go off and do the research and you just copy and paste all this stuff into the document, into this WordPress doc, whatever it is that you're using. For me, it was very often WordPress, um, pasting it right in there and then trying to make sense of it. I would just like throw up my hands, like, forget it. Like, no, like, because I can't see a view of everything. I don't know what's in this, like, document at this point i know i've been doing research and then like something else shiny comes up and you move on and you run across three months later you run across a post that's similar to what you were going to work on that has all sorts of great stuff in it but so what am i going to do now with that like do i use that as a baseline so i had all of this like 
need to create great content. I had a lack of tools to really get that great content produced when I needed it. Um, so yeah, so we started talking to more specifically to teams that like HubSpot. We interviewed their, some of their, they've got a lot of content people, but we interviewed some about their process. It was so convoluted to create like blog posts. It was completely pieced together nonsense, right? But, and other content all over the place. We're talking to Moz, Unbounce, everybody about what they were doing. And yeah, the same convoluted process came up, but underneath it, there was the same underlying not convoluted process, which was we need a lot of great information that other people are making on our team and outside of our team. We need to organize that. And then we need to be able to get it to a form where we can publish it rapidly. Period. Okay. So if that's like the core, that's what you need. How can we put those pieces in place for you? And that was the starting point for Air Story, where we then went, we put a very early version together. We got a lot of user feedback. That whole partnership, that initial version completely fell apart when my partnership with the person I was working on, it fell apart. So we restarted from scratch about a year ago, almost a year exactly, um, and did more just iterating, get this out there, lots of testing, three rounds of beta testing um, to finally arrive at a place where we feel we've got the collaboration and the ability to create in a really solid place. And I think anybody listening to this can relate to one, the idea of looking at a blank canvas or a blank page uh, Two, the, the shiny object syndrome thing. You just get fatigued and you, you bounce off to something else. I mean, th- this is something that I've been actually talking about a lot on my podcast, just the, the, the management of mental energy in the creative process. And the fact that you, it takes different mental states to, put together creative work like this, such as the research, such as what I call the barf draft, such as outlining, such as tying it all together into, uh, into a, a document. And, uh, I think that people try to just power through it and that's how they get totally, uh, fatigued. And so a tool like this kind of helps silo those mental states so that the work can go a little smoothly, you get a little less fatigue and it's a little less scary to face the blank page. I, that's, I mean, that's enough that we're hearing from, from beta users and now real, quote unquote, real users. They were always real, but now like they're uh, it's on beta. Um, but yeah, it is. I, what I like about it and what helps me with it is that I can, because I'm busy, like almost everybody on the planet would say the same thing. I'm busy. I'm busy. Totally. And we're all busy. When you're busy, you need to feel a sense of working towards something. Um, and so for me, when I can just send research that I come across back to my Air Story project, and then when I've got time in my calendar to go work on that blog post, I go into that project. And it's not a blank page. There is a blank page there. But next to it is this card library that has 15 different points that I've collected over the last week and sent to it. So I'm like, you have that moment where you're like, okay, I mean, you know, you're not starting from scratch. You can just start outlining it, just click into outline and start outlining it, dragging things into place. And suddenly you're actually feeling much further ahead than otherwise and getting it to a really good point. Um, so it's been so far. It's been great for me in that way. We've got lots of room to improve, just like a lot of solutions do. Um, But it feels like there's something when people start using it. And if you've like had struggles with writing before, not because you're not a good writer or a good researcher, but because the tool wasn't built for you, um, then this is where, yeah, we're seeing really good results and we're very optimistic. It's like it, it gives you a bunch of little pieces of clay that you can put together to make a big mound of clay that you can actually sculpt instead of just saying, make a sculpture. Exactly. Here's no clay. I think of it as like Lego bricks, right? Like I think mm, of it yeah. as like you don't just, a house doesn't appear with Lego, right? It's not like, and for me, it was houses. We didn't have fancy kits growing up. We had like the basic bucket of Lego and you kept building houses out of it. Um you but, have to figure yeah, it out it yourself. Just, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know if there's instructions. Kids have kits with instructions. What? Oh, we didn't have that. Um, but yeah, but you, it didn't disappear. It never disappears. And that's the thing. This, the blank page is asking you to make something appear. That's 
That's not how it works. And that's a hugely frustrating thing. So yeah, you say clay. I fully agree. I always see it as Lego, possibly also because the cards are in like square form. So you like, I see them stacking up in my head. Um, But yeah, that's the idea. We're going to take a quick break. I love ordering stuff from Amazon. In the realm of the obvious, I also enjoy eating, sleeping, and breathing. And you probably like Amazon too. That's why I want to give you a $20 Amazon gift card. Sounds good, right? Here's how to get it. Go to katavi.net slash survey and take the Love Your Work listener survey. The survey is just a few simple questions. It will take you less than two minutes. It's like less time than I spend each day just waiting for Facebook to load in my browser. I'm giving away a $20 Amazon gift card every week until April 7th. When you take the listener survey, you're entered to win a gift card. In fact, you should go to academy.net slash survey right now and take the quick survey. Why? Because the sooner you take the survey, the more chances you get to win a $20 Amazon gift card. Go to academy.net slash survey. That's academy.net slash survey. And so uh, this idea came from having access to all all these people who write for a, a living. And uh, I think that ties into the business that, that your other business, Copy Hackers, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, it's, it's a good fit for Copy Hackers. Like it's a good solution for our audience um, in particular because we've got so many content marketers. Um, that read copy hackers, thankfully, a lot of copywriters too, um, are, are reading it. So it's, yeah, it's there to help. I mean, anything that we talk about, all of the research we do, every part of the conversion copywriting process that we talk about at copy hackers is supported by what happens in Air Story. So absolutely, mm-hmm. right? Like if you're going to write, we would never start from scratch. We'd never say, sit there and stare at the page. We'd say, go listen to your customers, go swipe messages from what you're prospects and customers are saying, and use that to write your next landing page, use that as a starting point. But before it was just like, okay, well, I'm going to go listen. We're going to go like, look through, like we say, Amazon review mining as a really good example of, okay, you want to go find your message. Maybe you don't have customers to interview. So go find books or products similar to yours on Amazon, read through the reviews for those. And find your great messages hidden in there, like what objections there are, what people were really hoping to get, what didn't work for them, um, all that kind of stuff. You can use that. But previously, it would be like this exercise. And I have a video on copyhackers.com of like Amazon review mining where it's, it's a Google Doc in one view with um, websites, the Amazon reviews on the other, like in a two screen view. Um, and it's just, it's me copying and pasting back and forth between like, here's an app, here, this is good language. I can use this later. I'm putting it into the Google Doc back and forth, back and forth, which is fine. It's just not very efficient. And it requires that I then go look at the Google Doc and now try to organize all of those pieces I just pasted in there would be more efficient for me to just live in that Amazon review, go through it, highlight things, turn them into cards I can tag. And then when I, of course, go in to write that landing page, I can say, okay, wow, look, this one word kept showing up or people are really talking a lot about this objection because it was pegged that way. And I can start making my messaging hierarchy of that. So it's definitely like the two sides, like copy hackers and then the writing I do, those all come together too. Um, yeah, as part of like the, the inspiration or the impetus for Air Story. Uh, and it's a little bit of a... I, a parallel to the idea of what Air Story is itself. The fact that you have a business that gave you something to work with that you then made something out of. And there's so many, I, I've had, I've met so many developers, seen so many people build something and then they're like, well, I can't get anybody to care about it. But then people like you, or I think Laura Roder is another great example of somebody who has had, had like a business that was uh, information and some consulting components to it, and then saw a certain problem and then, then developed software to solve that problem and instant customer base. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's that weekend when she said that, um, um, she would complain to her husband. I think he was her partner at the time. 
she would complain to her husband, like but she kept teaching the same things, right? I would keep telling people, this is how to do social media marketing, this is how to do it. If only there were a tool that lets me do it that way. And then he was like, well, I can build that. <laughs> and then and it, a company was born, right? Edgar was born. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. And that's kind of the same, the same thing here. It's just, of course, um, so having that platform is good. Having that access to an audience is good. Um, then comes the education part, of course, for us, right? And everybody's going to deal with the same thing no matter what. But we've got something that people are not used to seeing. People are used to the struggle of a blank page. Um, and they've worked up their own workarounds there. So we still now we have the process of, yes, we have this list of awesome content marketers and people who should be using AirStory. Now our job becomes helping them understand how and why, which is a good job to have though. And can you take us back to how Copy Hacker started? Yeah, totally. It happened, it started around the same time you started with Design for Hackers, I think. Yeah, I think that you and I both have uh, Hacker News to thank for for getting us uh, off the ground in our respective businesses, so... Totally. Yeah. I think your book came out before, if I'm remembering it correctly, I feel like I saw Design for Hackers and thought, what if I did coffee for oh, hackers? Really? <laughs> yeah. Because I had great. this book underway. I had all these things in place. I'd been doing all this stuff. I'd written the book, but it was, it was this mega book, like 200 pages for an ebook, which is too much, according to our beta readers. So we broke it up into four books. Um, but yeah, we were on Hacker News and I'm pretty sure, I know there was blank for hackers and I, I, I'm pretty sure it was designed for hackers. And so I, I wrote down copy for hackers and then we just worked through that idea. And then Lance was like, well, maybe, you know, drop the four. Um, and so we just did copy hackers and, and that was it. Um, but that happened at the beginning. That happened five and a half years ago on Hacker News. Um, is where we launched after putting in, you know, a year's worth of time of working with people from the Hacker News community. We were optimizing a lot of copy for free over that period because I like liked doing it. And I had like this awesome full-time job at Intuit. Where Wait, can, like, you go through, of, can you go through this, oh, this, this thing about helping people with their copy on, on Hacker News? Can, can you talk about that? Yeah. So what happened? So, um, um, there's this gentleman, Sharif Bache, who's like this great programmer. He's got a great following on Hacker News. Anyway, he had done a show HN, which is where you show Hacker News something you've just built. So he did a show HN. He's like, here's this thing. I think it was for Dev Bootcamp. No, it was for something else that was super technical. It was so technical. And his homepage read like it was really technical. So I was like, when he did a show HN, I was like, hey, cool, that's neat. And I gave him some feedback on the copy on how he could maybe like, even though it's for engineers, you could still make it easier to understand your value proposition, things like that. And he was like, cool, I'd love to hear more. So I sent, I put together a deck where I just like took screenshots of his homepage and just like pointed things out and said how I would write it. Sent that to him. A couple weeks passed, and then I was, it was my birthday, October 26th. We were out for dinner. We came home from dinner, and I had like 50 emails in my personal inbox. And I was working for a big company. I didn't, nobody ever emailed me at my personal email. I had 50 emails at least, 50, and they were just still coming in. And I was like, what's going on? Like, what happened? What's wrong? Oh no, like, did someone, like, what? He thinks the worst for some reason immediately. And then I saw, I went some, you know, something in the email, of course, would have said, like, saw you on Hacker News. So I went over to Hacker News and saw at the very top of the homepage of Hacker News, um, which is a great place to get to, right? The very top was, um, uh, Sharif had written something about, this is why I love the Hacker News community. And then he used what I'd given him as an example, like, look what you guys do. Look what we do for each other, right? And it was like, here's the deck she gave me. We went and did this differently thanks to that deck. And of course, after that, everybody was like, can you help me with my copy? You helped Sharif. Can you help me with mine? So we had all these emails. Can you help me with mine? Can you help me with mine? So the first 10, I was like, yeah, I can. And then by the by, like the 10th one, I was like, shoot. <laughs> I don't think I can keep saying yes to this. So then I started saying, you know, I'm really sorry. I'd love to, but I can't. I'm already like working with all these other ones now. Um, they were like, well, you should definitely write a book then. Like, we need help with this. Definitely write a book. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. I could do that. 
Um, so yeah, so over the course of the next year ish, I worked with a whole bunch of these companies just doing quick little value proposition exercises and things like that, turned all of that information into a book. And then about a year after Sharif posted that, I launched on Hacker News and got to the top of the first page and stayed there for a while and sold about $30,000, $20,000 in eBooks in like three days, which was like, what? This is actually going to work, right? What are the eBooks priced at? Oh, like $11.99 for all of them. I know. Darmesh Shah bought one and Lance and I were like high-fiving. We're like, Darmesh Shah just bought coffee hackers. That was awesome. Um, So yeah, but it was super cheap and we got a lot of sales. But then you make the mistakes. You weren't ready for that, right? I didn't collect any email addresses. Going forward, I never collected an email address for anybody who bought on our site or on AppSumo or other places. So while others were growing their list big time, I was not. Um, doing that, I was doing it, you know, on my blog. But, but yeah, no, that was how it, that's how it all got started um, with the Hacker News community. That yeah. I love that story. And so, you, I don't know, most people probably wouldn't go ahead and put together a whole deck to to help somebody out on that. Do Do you have any insight into what compelled you to do that? Boredom, <laughs> pure boredom. Um, I, I don't know. I think I really like startups, right? Like I really, really like startups. And I did, I had a really cushy job at Intuit where I was working from home. I'd been doing this job for five years. I could do it asleep. Um, and like it was all based in like CMSs, right? So like I was doing all my work in a CMS. So I built the whole land. I didn't have to talk to anybody. I just sat at home at my desk got my work done before 11 in the morning. And then you're like, well, now what? <laughs> so like I could, you go for a run and then you get home an hour later, like, well, now what? So I was spending a lot of time on Hacker News. And when I was just one of those people who was like, give me something to do, I'll do it. Like, I, cool, that's neat. You need some help with that. I can help you with that. And then just, just did that. So that was, it was really having the luxury of time, which I know a lot of people don't have. But if you are in a position where you've got some time, it is a good, I mean, no, I don't I, know how possible. No, but. most people would watch Netflix or something. I, I, maybe maybe this Netflix is hard for you. Thing, really, That's sometimes. true. That's a good good point. If it had been, this might have never happened. <laughs> yeah. Right? I, I don't know. I, I, mean, I feel like there's something cool. else like, that, that maybe you can't see it because you're you, right? So I don't feel like most people know. would do that. Really? I, yeah, I guess. I mean, if it was like, if you were really passionate about movies and you were in a community of people who make movies, produce movies, love movies, and somebody who had just put out a movie was like, here's my movie poster. What do you guys think? And you're like, uh oh, there's some opportunity here. And they're like, cool, I'd love to hear more. Then you'd be like, cool, here's my redo of like how I would write your movie poster. Here you go. Um, so it's like whatever you're excited about. I was just really excited about startups, like the whole offer. I think it's part of it, like being at Intuit, which was this giant tech company selling software that, although I love TurboTax, I did not love QuickBooks. Very intimidating software. And so the idea of working startups solving software problems, right? It's like software is supposed to solve a problem, but software alone also has problems. So startups are able to solve that. It was cool, right? It's just a cool thing. I just happened to geek out on startups. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's just one little piece building upon another until now we have we have Air Story. What what's what things do you know now that you didn't know then? Oh, everything, everything is nothing. Maybe um, now I know that there's no such thing as a lifestyle business. I would say. Is that what you thought you were getting into when you started? Oh, yeah. I was like, cool, this is going to be like, I'll blog once a week. It'll take like a day. And then I'll just like sell (laughs) ebooks. Like, what? What? It hasn't gone that way at all. Um, Blogging takes a lot of work. Sustaining a business, growing a business, it takes a lot of work. If you want to like keep doing it, I didn't want to go back in house. I like doing my own thing and the idea of pursuing my own like startup. That's cool. Um, so yeah, I, I know that it's not, there's, if you want to do it right, there's probably no such thing as a lifestyle business, unless maybe you're Pat Flynn, but I think even he works 
a lot in spite of the smart passive income idea. I think there's a lot happening there too, but that's one of the big ones I guess. I think like, you know, what would you do with all your free time if you you know, right. isn't this I'd what you would be doing away anyway? Giving on Hacker News, exactly, right? I mean, this is like, that's I what you did with your know. evenings when you were into it. It was like, oh, just go make a, make a deck to help somebody with their copies. So obviously, this is what you do for fun. Yeah, and, and I, I love it. It's just, you don't go on. I don't, I don't know. I haven't been to Hawaii in like four years. That's a problem for me. I would like to go back to Hawaii. I dig Hawaii. Um, so I, those, those kinds of things, right? Like where you get, I think, really caught up. For me, I've been caught up in growing a business. I like it a lot. And other things just don't take priority um, when maybe they should. But, but I do. I'm not complaining. Like I love it. I love the adventure of it. So I guess that's another thing. I wouldn't have known that all of the scariness that comes with growing a business can actually be like, that's the adventure that you're on. And it's a cool adventure. Like every time you get up on stage and you're like scared out of your mind, that there are 1500 people looking at you and like, you have to say something that's going to get you good ratings at the end of it. Cause they've all got their phones and they can all review your talk that you just gave. That's scary as F, but it's also like that's the adventure and I wouldn't have thought of it that way until probably the last year that like no no this isn't the part you avoid this is the part you were looking for I, I had no idea yeah so the, the, like the discomfort of being evaluated the scariness of like putting yourself out there it's super I work with a lot of freelance copywriters most of them would very much like to just like stay quietly in the background, like just typing out little things and like hoping to like make some good money and all that stuff. But that's not the adventure part of it. That's the easy part. Then comes the scary part that is so much more interesting. At the time, it's just terrifying. But then you grow so much from it and you get so much out of it. And I'm speaking now, especially to like giving talks. Um, that's, that's the part that, um, it just makes, it's just not what I would have expected. I didn't expect that I would love the scariest part so much. And I think that next time I do something scary, I'll have to remind myself that this is the good thing. Like you want to do the scary stuff because it, it's the thing that's supposed to hold you back from getting ahead, right? Do you, remember, do, this. do you happen to remember like the moment that you discovered that, you know, that you wanted to go towards the fear if I'm getting that right? Yeah, I think it was sometime like last year. I've only recently started the phrase, this is the adventure that keeps coming up for me. Like, this is the adventure. Um, that's only been the past couple of months, but it was about a year ago when I had spoken on stage at CTA Comp at Unbounce's Call to Action Conference. And I left the stage. Um, I always had a lot of anxiety, but later that night, my worst thing isn't just building up to it. It's the night after you give a talk when you're laying in your hotel room and you're thinking like you're replaying every single thing you said on stage. Like, did I say that? Did I really say that? And like beating yourself up for it. I beat myself up for a talk that went over really well. I beat myself up for weeks, for actual mm. weeks. I had to take like sleeping medication in order to not wake up at three beating myself up for the most irrational crap, right? And then finally around Christmas time, um, it just kind of like washed off me. Like I just stopped caring about that. Like it wasn't worth caring because it wasn't doing anything. And the better part, the part that I was like suppressing was the coolness of actually having gone on stage and people like high-fiving you afterward and stuff like the, the coolness right now that you've like, you've done that, you've got that video and you've like experienced it and there are shots of you on stage and it's like, cool. Um, but I, I forgot about that. And then finally, yeah, it was around Christmas when I just like let that go away and accept it. And now I'm not scared to get on stage. Now I like go, okay, I haven't prepared. All right, I'll get up there. If nobody's going, I'll go up there and I'll give my talk. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it was about a year ago, I think, that, that it changed for me. And oh, wow. I don't know why. It's a miracle. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the talk I saw you give at MicroConf two years ago was like one of the best talks I've ever seen oh, anywhere. Yeah, that right? was was a, so actionable and like that. full of wisdom. So, wisdom. Thank you. 
we'll pretend it's well, it was, it, just, it, it just showed that you had a very uh, a very structured understanding of copy and that you were able to communicate in a way that all of us could understand it so cool well thank you fun. yeah fun I'm all about structured understanding of complex things. So that's, oh, I geek out okay. on that. Oh, yeah. nice. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, we, we're sense. getting pretty close to, uh, close to our time limit, but, um, do you have like a, a final message to, to wrap up what, what we've talked about today? No, no. <laughs> um, no, no, I, I think, I mean, no, the, there's so much, right? Like I'm so in the middle of maybe even at the beginning of, I hope at the beginning of the adventure, if that's what this really is. So how do you wrap it up? Like I'm just, it's just getting started. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what the future holds for Air Story, right? It might be that nobody uses it and that the people that are using it now just stop using it and we have to pivot and I'll look back at this and say like, Oh, I wish I'd done that so differently. Um, hmm. But yeah, I don't, I don't think so. It's like a, it's like, it's a just getting started sort of moment for me. I see sort of like a, an improvisational theme or thread throughout your career up to this point in, in, in that, you know, you, you're doing things and you're kind of yes ending those things over and over again. And then you're one of those, one of those moments right now. And like, that's one of the exciting things about doing something improvisational is you kind of don't know what's going to happen. And, and it's a little scary. And yes, but that's like the, maybe the exciting part is, I mean, it would be nicer to know exactly what roadmap to follow. Like I'd love to have a path. If someone said here, do exactly this. Um, and I've had a few moments of people saying, do exactly this. And it's been like, wow, that really works. That actually works. So I'm sure there's like a better way than what I've done. But then I'm, 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 you know, I grew up on the lean startup methodology and this like idea of just like put a lean version out, see what happens and then iterate. Um, so I think that's been true for me throughout. Like you say, yes, improv, improvisational. It's been that way the whole time, kind of like stumbling into the next thing. And we, I know we had that big talk after microconf. We were all sitting around the table and a bunch of people were dissecting what I was doing wrong with my business, essentially. And it did. I'm sorry. It was, I it, think it, I started that. <laughs> you did. It was all you. It's all your fault. No, but it was, it was a good talk, but it does. It's, it's definitely been me just trying to like follow the course and not screw it up. But I do think I'm getting, taking on more of a, like more agency in my decisions today. And we'll see if that's, if that's how this new path goes for me. It's not a new path. It's just, this is a slight shift, of course. Yeah. All right. So where should people go? They should go to copyhackers.com for all things copywriting. Um, if they are in the business of marketing, go to airstory.co and try out Airstory. Give it a shot. Go to a demo. See what's up with it. Yeah, um, that's what they should do. And Twitter at copyhackers with an S. All right. Joanna Weeb, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Joanna Weeb. We talked a bit about how Joanna's path is a lot like Laura Roeder's path. Both Joanna and Laura built their information businesses into self-serve apps. Check out Laura Roeder, who's founder of the social media automation app Meet Edgar, over on episode nine. And if you appreciate all the work that goes into making this show, there are a couple of ways you can help support it. One is to subscribe, 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 subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Just hit the subscribe button. Another is to rate the show on iTunes. Just go to cadavy.net slash iTunes and click on write a review and click on the star rating. You don't even have to write a review. It just takes a couple of seconds. And do you like books? If you do, I'd love to send you my book recommendations. About 90% of them will be nonfiction on subjects spanning from biographies to neuroscience. Just go to cadavy.net slash reading, sign up, and you'll get my first set of recommendations right away. You'll be supporting the show if you buy any of those books through the links in the email. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for the show is More Streets, performed by Spider Flower. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>